911. What is your emergency? Something just blew through my car. Like, I don't know if it's a bullet. We're going to get an officer out there. I just called the police a few good minutes ago, and they're still not here. And I just got shot at in the car. I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. Hi, I just called. I'm going to drive to the police station. Is that okay? Is he breathing? He's barely breathing. How many times is the f***? A lot of people have called in on you, so I don't think that nobody's just sitting there. They're actually called in and they're not going to get themselves in danger because you put yourself in danger. I'm scared. I've never had anything like this happen to me before. Well, this will, te this will teach you next time don't drive in the water. You know, obviously, if he comes inside the residence and assaults you, can you ask him to go away? Nearly every American, no matter their age, knows to call 911 in case of an emergency as 911 dispatchers are meant to be there when we need them most. But what happens when those calls for help go unanswered, or worse, are met with inaction? So today, through this video, we will be covering four cases when 911 operators were anything but helpful. But first, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Our first story starts on July 1st, 2020, when Kelly Tichenell, a Pennsylvania woman filled with worry, called 911 as her 54-year-old mother, Diana Kronk, was experiencing troubling symptoms. Kelly described her mother as turning yellow and unresponsive. This wasn't normal, and fear gripped Kelly as she dialed 911, the number meant to be a lifeline in the case of emergencies. Green K-9-1 was emergency. My mom, she's really bad. She's in, she hasn't been out of the bed in like three days. She, ever since she moved in with this guy out here, all she does is drink. She's turning yellow. The last time I saw her was like a week ago. She had lost like so much weight. There's like nothing left to her. And now my brother just said that she's laying in the bed like making noises. I don't know, but we need to get her to a hospital. On the other end of the line was Leon Price, a 911 operator for Greene County's 911 center. What should have been a prompt and professional exchange turned into a desperate plea met with a response that would later be called into question. Okay, is she willing to go to the hospital? She will be because I'm on my way there, so she's going. Okay. Or she's she... going to die. Okay, is this a police issue or... Because we can't force her to go in an ambulance. No, it's not a police issue. I'll get her to go in the ambulance. I would take her in my car, but I don't think I'd be able to get her in the car because she can't even move. Okay, we can't force her to go in an ambulance. Okay, well, can we just try? Okay, how about calling us back to make sure she's willing to go before we send resources out there in case she says no? Okay. Okay, and then as long as she's willing to go, we'll get the ambulance out there and make sure everything's okay or, you know, whatever she needs done. Okay. Okay? This back and forth went on for a bit, with Price suggesting something that, sadly, turned out to be quite a terrible idea. Now, given that Diana Kronk was unresponsive, asking for her permission here shows a grave lapse in judgment on Price's part. To make things worse, Kelly had already informed him that her mother's place had no cell service. That's precisely the reason why she was calling 911 while driving to her mother's place. So calling back was out of the question, but that somehow didn't seem to register with Price. Unfortunately, when Kelly arrived, her mother's health took an even deeper dive and due to lack of cell service, she wasn't able to make that second call. All she could do was wait in the hopes that the ambulance would somehow show up at the doorsteps and take her mom to the hospital. And well, you can guess the rest. No ambulance arrived at Diana Kronk's home and the next day the unthinkable happened as Diana passed away from complications of internal bleeding. I just called 911 thinking that they would send an ambulance to my mom. I told him what was wrong and he didn't want to send an ambulance and I pretty much begged him. And I told him that she was going to die if she didn't get help. And he told me to call back after I got there and I told him that there was no service and why would I call back if he didn't want to send an ambulance the first time. She hemorrhaged through her esophagus into her stomach. So I feel if she would have went to the hospital, basically she could have gotten blood transfusions that would have, you know, helped her not die from bleeding. And then they could have done surgery or at least tried to save her. 
Right after this whole mess, an investigation was launched after Kelly filed a federal lawsuit that didn't just target Price, but also Greene County itself, and even two supervisors at the emergency dispatch center. Turns out that Price's carelessness led to severe outcomes. He later was charged with involuntary manslaughter, reckless endangerment, and official oppression and obstruction. The whole case basically hinges on him refusing to send help unless he was absolutely positively sure that Diana would agree to go to the hospital. A ridiculous demand given her condition. I said, my mother's going to die. And she died less than 24 hours later. I wanted him to be held responsible. And I knew that it wouldn't happen if I didn't go after Greene County. So, and I was right. It took a lawsuit two years later for them to file charges. During the court case, the detectives laid it out plain and simple. Price messed up big time. 911 policy says he should have sent an ambulance right away as dispatchers are trained for these situations. They're supposed to assess what's happening and not go asking for permission from someone who can't even respond. What's even worse is the fact that according to District Attorney Dave Russo, there were three ambulances sitting idle, ready to go. Price seemed to just ignore all that and keep on with his questions. According to the lawsuit, Price did not have the authority to deny services to Diana, and that his actions were a direct or proximate cause of her death. Because Ms. Kronk was denied services, uh, there was a policy in place where they need to respond to these services. We believe his actions were reckless. I want to know why this happened in my county. Kelly also sought major damages for the emotional stress this whole thing caused her. Meanwhile, District Attorney Dave Russo didn't hold back either. As district attorneys, we have a responsibility to look at where does criminal culpability lie? Um, you know, we looked at this case and there was a death and we felt that it was necessary to move forward. You'd think cases like this would be shockingly rare, but it's happened before. Back in 2008, a 911 operator in Detroit got a year of probation and lost her job because she blew off a little boy who was calling for help when his mom collapsed. The poor five-year-old testified that she accused him of playing games and hung up while she claimed she couldn't hear him properly. Getting back to Diana's case, if you're thinking that after the matter came to light and after due investigation, things would go smoothly, right? Wrong. Just days later, authorities slapped charges on three more people. A criminal complaint says these three guys were charged with tampering with records, hiding evidence, and straight up obstruction. They were all managers at Greene County's emergency management, and prosecutors think they tried to cover up the whole mess by giving investigators incomplete records. Sadly, it seems like they might have gotten away with it. A judge tossed out all charges against those three emergency management supervisors. The judge also dismissed some lesser charges against price stuff like official oppression and obstruction of justice. But thankfully, the serious ones are still moving forward including the two misdemeanor counts of involuntary manslaughter and reckless endangerment. Kelly emphasized that this lawsuit is essential to prevent similar injustices from happening to others. I'm so happy that we're getting justice for my mother. This is all I wanted was for him to be held accountable because she should still be alive today. And I'm thankful for the DA stepping up and pressing charges again. With Leon Price, the damage was still contained. It was a single and yet terrible act. But what this next 911 operator did, it wasn't just a mistake. It was a catastrophe, affecting not just tens, not hundreds, but thousands of people. Investigators say that between October 2015 and March 2016, Houston Emergency Center managers tracked thousands of dropped calls to a single 911 operator. This woman, 43-year-old Crenshonda Williams. Emergency calls varied in severity, but all of them were urgent. An unconscious woman possibly having a heart attack, a robbery in progress, and reckless drivers racing on the interstate. These are just a few of the thousands of calls allegedly cut short by a single Houston 911 operator. Prosecutors said the operator simply hung up on the callers. Sounds like a nightmare, right? But for thousands of people in Houston, Texas, this wasn't just a bad dream. It was their reality thanks to this rogue 911 operator named Crenshonda Williams. Now, before we begin on Williams, we do acknowledge that being a 911 operator is no walk in the park. It's one emotionally and mentally taxing job. Not only do operators face long shifts of 12 hours or more, but also manage constantly changing crises and even endure verbal abuse from distressed callers. However, operators are aware of these challenges when they sign up understanding the severity of their job and how at times their actions can very well impact the difference between life and death in someone's life. 
a concept that's clearly lost on Miss Williams. Initially, Williams seemed to be handling the job. She answered questionnaires indicating she understood the unique stressors and demanding schedule. Her training went smoothly, and there were no immediate red flags. Williams wasn't a veteran dispatcher, she was a new operator. Initially, a supervisor monitored her calls closely, but once she seemed comfortable, the monitoring relaxed. That's when things changed. It was only after Williams was given the freedom to work independently that the cracks started to show. Believe it or not, Williams said she simply didn't want to talk. Yet she was more than happy to get paid for a job she wouldn't do, a job where people's lives depended on her answering the phone. Williams even explained further that sometimes she'd answer calls and drop them if she actually spoke to someone. But other times, when things were stressful, if her day went bad or if she was upset with her supervisor, she'd hang up before the caller even spoke a word. She'd hear the call come in and just disconnect because she didn't want to talk. There's no excuse for this behavior. No amount of stress justifies hanging up on people in emergencies. This wasn't just a mere mistake, but a deliberate choice that could have had serious consequences. Williams knew perfectly well that she could have used the not ready status. This option would have alerted supervisors to her temporary unavailability, but she deliberately avoided it. Why? Because not ready time negatively impacts an operator's performance metrics. One of the callers was Buster Pendley, who reported that Williams hung up on him after his wife collapsed from a blood clot moving to her lungs. Where the minivan is sitting right, right here by the house, that's where she fell. I was gasping and I could feel her heart beating out of her chest, but I couldn't get a pulse. 911 operator answered the phone and she said, this is Krishanda, may I help you? I said, yes, my wife's passed out, I need an ambulance. When uh, she said, okay, and she hangs up on me. I was furious because he didn't tell me because I would have, I mean, I would have gotten from my hospital bed and gone to 911 find out who did that to me. He made another call, and fortunately, a different operator answered this time. An ambulance was dispatched, and thankfully, his wife Sharon Stevens survived. That call took place in March 2016. Days later, Hua Lee, an engineer, dialed 911 to report an armed robbery at a convenience store. Lee was buying lottery tickets at a Raceway convenience store on Mills Road, and as soon as he walked inside, he saw a robbery taking place with a man holding a gun and attempting to force his way into a room behind the counter. Lee ran out of the store and on his way out heard gunshots. Desperate to alert authorities, he jumped into his car and dialed 911 to report the deadly robbery. I heard there were actually at least five gunshots. Was like, boom, 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 boom. Unfortunately, Williams answered the first call, only to hang up before Lee could speak a word. In a panic, he dialed again and was horrifyingly reconnected to Williams. This time, he managed to mention robbery before she hung up on him for the second time. They, they said, this is 911 call, how can I help you? And then I, I was trying to finish my sentence, and then, you know, it got disconnected. Precious seconds turned into a terrifying minute before his desperate third call finally reached another operator who completed Lee's request for emergency assistance. But by the time police arrived, the tragedy was complete as the store manager had been shot and killed, leaving behind four children. In another incident, on March 13th, a security guard witnessed two motorists recklessly racing on I-45 South and dialed 911. Once again, Williams was the operator. The call was abruptly cut off before the guard could even fully state his name. In the findings, apparently after disconnecting the security guard's call, Williams was then overheard saying, ain't nobody got time for this. Williams was put on trial for knowingly interfering with Lee's emergency calls and faced serious charges including two counts of interference with an emergency telephone call, a class A misdemeanor punishable by up to a year in jail, and a $4,000 fine for each count. Her statement to police was that she did this when she was angry with her supervisor, if she was going through a stressful situation at home, or that she just didn't want to talk. And at the end of the day, that's not just negligent, it's not just not doing her job, um, it's a crime, and that's why we decided to prosecute her to the fullest extent of the law. Williams broke rules and ignored protocol, driven by her own selfish desires which cost innocent people their lives. But shockingly, even 911 operators who strictly follow every rule can endanger lives too. Such was the terrifying reality for Lacey Guyton, a young mother trapped in a horrific scenario. Nobody's coming. And I don't know if I'm watching my baby die right in front of me. On August 18th, 2018, a routine visit to her grandmother suddenly turned into a nightmare for Lacey Guyton and her two-month-old daughter, Raina. While getting ready to head back home, Lacey secured Raina in her car seat and also put a diaper bag in the car, then shut the door. 
As Lacey walked around to the driver's seat, she heard the doors of her Dodge minivan lock. That's when she realized her keys were inside the diaper bag beside her daughter. Tried this handle and then tried that one and neither of them were unlocking it. Without hesitation, she told her grandma to immediately call 911. My granddaughter just put her baby in the car and the car door locked and we can't get in it. We don't unlock vehicles. We just need to get her out. Yeah, I'm sorry, we don't have the tool. When the call turned out to be useless, Lacey grabbed a chunk of asphalt off the ground and started bashing it into the front passenger window of the car as hard as she could. When that failed, Lacey's grandma retrieved a window breaker for the mom to try. Unfortunately, all of her efforts were doing nothing. They called 911 again and got the same operator. Even this time, the operator's response didn't help, leaving Lacey feeling helpless and increasingly frustrated. You send a fire department to come break my window open. I just need it open. I can send you a record service. They will charge you, but a fire department doesn't come out for that. It's completely unacceptable that 911 offered to send a tow truck instead of emergency services. Every second counts in a situation like this. With temperatures in Waterford reaching 84 degrees, that car's interior could have become an oven in minutes. Feeling defeated, Lacey decided to ask the towing company to come while she tried to break the glass. Within the next few minutes, Raina stopped crying and her eyes began to close. Lacey feared the worst, unsure if her baby was passing out from the heat or simply falling asleep. She later wrote, realizing no emergency help is coming to save my baby was the worst feeling in the world. With the tow truck's arrival time uncertain, Lacey had no other choice. She shattered the back windshield with the window breaker, climbed in over the broken glass, and retrieved Raina. I you know, just ran to the back windshield and took the window breaker and just smashed it. And the glass just, you know, shattered, fell straight down, and then I just crawled through right here. Her baby was safe, but hot, sweaty, and screaming. This harrowing experience lasted roughly 15 minutes. Outraged, Lacey took to Facebook to share her experience and demand change from the police department to prevent similar situations. Her post went viral, attracting widespread attention and leading to interviews with multiple news outlets. After the incident, Waterford Police Chief Scott Underwood came to Lacey's home to personally offer a sincere apology and to cover the cost of the damaged windshield. He also released a statement. While it's true we typically don't respond to locked vehicles, this situation was clearly different. We should have helped and will do so in the future when there's a risk to anyone's safety, especially a child's. We acknowledge our error and are committed to ensuring this doesn't happen again. We will learn from this and improve our procedures. The most distressing aspect of this case is that the 911 operator who refused to help was not a new recruit, but rather an experienced member of the dispatch call center. If there's one thing we've learned from these 911 calls, it's the chilling reality that sometimes no one is coming to save you. And this next case will show you just that. In June 2015, Jaden Chavez Silver, a popular 17-year-old high school senior, found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. While partying with a friend in Albuquerque, someone unleashed a barrage of shots towards their building. Unfortunately, Jaden was hit by one of the bullets and crumpled to the ground. One of his friends did what anyone would do under those horrible circumstances. She called 911. Esperanza Quintero, also 17 at the time, jumped into action initiating CPR while speaking to 911. The call connected her with the medical dispatcher and firefighter, Matthew Sanchez. In the recorded conversation, you can hear Esperanza responding to Sanchez's questions while tirelessly performing CPR on Jaden. CPR, as we speak, I'm keeping him alive. Okay, is he not breathing? Barely, stay warm. Okay. One of us, stay close, one of us. Yes. Stay close, Jaden. Good job. Just stay with me, okay? Okay? There you go, good job, Jaden. You see, 911 operators are trained to keep you on the line to gather crucial information for dispatching the right resources. They're also advised never to hang up, even if they're itching to, as it would then be flagged by a supervisor. But in this case, things went sideways. Instead of diving into the critical details, Sanchez fixated on one question, whether the teen was breathing. This threw Esperanza off, understandably so. Watching her friend teetering on the brink of life, she couldn't hold back her frustration and let out a few choice words. Sure, it's a high-pressure situation, especially for a 17-year-old. But what's not okay is Sanchez letting that swearing get to him, leading him to abruptly end the call. Is he breathing? Oh my God. He's barely breathing. How many times is the f you telling you? 
Okay, you know what, ma'am? You could do it yourself. I'm not going to do with this, okay? No, my friend is dying. Being on the phone with them, getting hung up on? That just made me even more upset. And I'm talking to the operator. He, he just hung up on me. He just hung up on me. And she says, I know, I know I'm trying to get someone else on the line for you. Thankfully, before cutting the call short, the dispatcher did send help. But it took four minutes and 26 seconds for them to arrive, surpassing national response standards. Jaden was rushed to a hospital where, sadly, he couldn't overcome his injuries and passed away. That call was heartbreaking. There are no other words to describe it. Um, to hear his, you know, friends try to, to help him fight for his life. Shortly after, a homicide investigation kicked off, but no suspects were arrested in connection to the drive-by shooting. Later, Jaden's parents decided to take legal action against the 911 operator, Matthew Sanchez. They claimed that he intentionally deserted a patient when he should have been doing his job, snatching away their son's last clear chance to be kept alive. Teenagers in such a tragic time and, you know, I just don't understand. I don't understand why he did what he did. And it's, it's just very, very upsetting. Accusing Sanchez of medical negligence and wrongful death, they had him in their legal crosshairs. Sanchez, who got sidelined on administrative leave post Jaden's passing, eventually threw in the towel and resigned. The suit filed by Jaden's family got settled for $50,000 in court. Until today, Jaden's mother, Nicole, is still fighting for crime reform in honor of her son. What exactly happened to Sanchez is not known to the public, but apparently he didn't face any legal action. That's it for today, folks. Please give it a like and subscribe so you won't miss out on upcoming episodes.